Hi everyone, I am Sujani, Faculty in Physics at Institute of Aeronautical Engineering, Hyderabad. Today we are going to discuss the definitions and terminology from module 3, that is laser and fiber optics. So before discussing, let us uh, see what a definition is. The act of defining or making something definite, distinct and clear, that is what we call a definition. Or in other words, we can say the formal statement of the meaning or the significance of a word or a phrase as seen in the dictionary. Or it can also be said as a statement which expresses the essential nature of something. Now, knowing about the definition, why is it important to define terms exactly? When we have to write a definition, we have to use the correct terminology and we have to define it very clearly. Why is it so important? Because it enables us to have a common understanding of the word or the subject. So when we are using a common thing, so it becomes very clear when you are communicating with others and they will allow all of us to be on the same page while discussing or reading about an issue. And therefore, we need to use, make use that we have to define our words and phrases so that everyone will understand. What is terminology? It is the body of terms used with a particular application, technical application in a subject of study or a profession. So what is the importance of terminology? Terminology plays an important role in understanding the context and specialized text. Understanding intricate terminological details of technical and scientific concepts helps the students to comprehend what the main message of the document is. Not only that, it also helps the specialists to transmit the con content in a very effective manner. So they can also use the terminology to deliver the content very effectively. So with this, uh, we will go into the module. So in module, we have uh, three, we have two parts. The first part is laser. So we'll be discussing about all definitions related to laser first. Stimulated absorption, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission. Then metastable state, population inversion, lasing action, all these are definitions. And then uh, we are also going to discuss definitions related to ruby laser, helium neon laser uh, also. And uh, maybe we may also see in applications how they are used. Now the first one, what write the abbreviation for laser? What does laser stand for? It is an acronym. Acronym for what? Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So when we say laser, it is an acronym. For what light? When I take light, the first letter L. Amplification A. Stimulated S. Emission E. And radiation R. So this is giving us laser. So, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Then what is MASER? The same way, MASER is also an acronym for microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. When we are talking about microwaves, then we call it as MASER. Nowadays, there are a lot of applications for MASER. So, MASER stands for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. So, these are the first letters which form the acronym for MASER. 
Now define the term stimulated emission of radiation. So we are talking in both the terms we have seen stimulated emission of radiation. So what is this stimulated emission of radiation? So let us understand stimulated emission. An atom which is in the excited state, it is made to de-excite to the ground state before its lifetime. How it is made to de-excite? By supplying a stimulus with the help of a photon. And that energy must be equal to the difference between the two energy levels. Then what happens? A photon whose energy is equal to H nu, that is E2 minus E1 is emitted along with the incident photon and this is what we are calling it as stimulated emission. So let us try to understand this. We have the ground state which is E1. We have the excited state E2. Now an atom which is in the excited state, if you are supplying some energy with the help of an incident photon and you are trying to make it de-excite, de-excite means come from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. Then what happens? The difference in energy between the two, this is higher level, this is lower level. So the difference in energy is being emitted. So that is uh, along with the incident photon. This is the incident photon and this is the emitted photon whose energy is given by E2 minus E1. So we are calling it as stimulated emission. Why is stimulated? Stimulating means we are trying to trigger it with the help of some external energy. And photons emitted in this are phase, are in phase. They are in the same phase. The incident photon and the emitted photon are in phase with each other thereby resulting in a coherent beam and we call it as laser. So if we want a laser, we have to go for stimulated emission and only in stimulated emission, we will get laser because it is a, it gives rise to coherent radiation. So with this understanding, let us see the exact definition. Define the term stimulated emission of radiation. So stimulated emission occurs when an atom or molecule which is in an energy level above the ground state, means I call it as excited state, interacts with a photon. An electron or an at atom excites in the energy level which is above the ground state, means in the excited level and that has an energy equal to that between the atom or molecule's current energy level and a lower energy level. So the current energy level is E2 and the lower energy level is E1. Now, if the atom in the excited state E is excited with a photon, E is equal to H nu, whose energy is equal to the difference between the two, there will be stimulated emission. That is the meaning. Now define the term spontaneous emission. What is spontaneous emission? Now, if an atom is in the excited state, it may spontaneously decay into the lower energy level after some time, releasing the energy in the form of a photon. So, and this is emitted in random direction. This is called spontaneous emission. Means, from the excited state, in spontaneous emission, what we see here, an atom initially present in the excited state, it makes transition voluntarily. Nothing can needs to be done. It comes down on its own without the aid of any external stimulus or agency. It comes to the ground state and it emits a photon of energy E2 minus E1. Naturally because it is at a higher level whose energy is E2 and it is coming to E1. So the difference in energy is being emitted. So the period of stay of the electron is called as lifetime and this process of emission we call it as spontaneous emission. So when, a, when the atom is in the excited state, if you see here, 
E2 represents the excited state. It is coming down on its own without any supply. So the difference in energy E2 minus E1 is being emitted. This is what we call it as spontaneous emission. Now they define the term absorption. What is absorption of radiation? It is a process in which optical energy is converted into internal energy of the electrons. Or when a photon is absorbed, the energy may cause an electron to go from a lower level to a higher level. So in absorption, the atom which is in the ground state will absorb the energy from the incident photon and it will go to the next higher level. So that is what we call it as absorption. And why we call it as stimulated absorption? Because the atom on its own cannot go to higher level because it needs energy to go to the higher level. So if a photon of energy H nu 1 2 means the difference in energy between the two levels. This is the energy of the ground level and this is the energy of the excited state. If that much energy photon collides with the atom in the ground state, then the atom will completely absorb the incident photon and makes transition to the excited state. So let us see what happens. So before absorption, E1 is the energy of the ground state, E2 is the energy of the excited state. And the atom is in the ground state. This is the ground state. This is all before absorption. Now, if this is supplied, this atom is supplied with an energy. What is the energy equal to? It should be equal to the difference between the two. H nu 1 2. If this atom is excited with this photon, then what happens? this atom will move from the ground state to the excited state. So it is going into the excited state E2. So this is what we call it as stimulated absorption. Define lifetime. What is lifetime? An atom in the excited state does not instantaneously de-excite. It spends little time. The time that it spends on an average in that excited level, we call it as lifetime. And the lifetime can vary in duration depending upon the atom or the energy level. So in which level or in which uh, atom it is. So it depends upon that. So for a hydrogen atom, the lifetime is different when compared with that of the nitrogen atom. So here it is a time it spends in that particular level. We call it as the lifetime. What is a metastable state? It is an excited state of an atom for which there is a longer lifetime than the other excited states. When you compare the lifetime in that particular state, it is longer when compared to the other excited states. So in metastable states, the atoms remain for a considerably longer time. That is 10 power minus 6 to 10 power minus 3 seconds. So that is what we call as metastable state. So define population inversion. What is population inversion? So to understand population inversion, first we should know what is population. So what is population here? The number of atoms present in the ground state. The number of atoms in that particular system we call the population. And if you see usually, if this is the ground state whose energy is E1, this is the excited state whose energy is E2. And N1 is the number of atoms in the ground state and N2 is the number of atoms in the excited state. So if you see the scenario here, in normal population condition, Always N1 is greater than N2. Means the number of atoms in the ground state is more than that in the excited state. So N1 in the ground state is larger than that in the E2. N2 than in the E2. 
So this condition can be written as n1 greater than n2. Now by some pumping mechanism, if we can make n2 greater than n1, what is n2 greater than n1? If the number of atoms in the excited state n2 is more than n1, you see this condition here, n2 is greater than n1. So, when this is there, it is inversion of this case. Here n1 is greater than n2. Here n2 is greater than n1. So, we are calling it as population inversion. So, the process of making n2 greater than n1, we are calling it as population inversion. So, let us look at the definition. When the population of the higher excited state n2 is more than the population of the lower energy state N1. It is called as population inversion. So simple, if we put it, N2 greater than N1. This is the population inversion condition. Now what is the need to get population inversion? Why should we have population inversion? Uh, will N1 greater than N2 not suffice? No. Population inversion is achieved. The majority of the atoms are in the excited state and this is favorable for lazy action because when the atoms in the excited state are more than in the ground state, if N2 is greater than N1, this condition is favorable for lazy action. What is lazy action here? means when the electrons from the higher level come down by stimulated emission, they give rise to laser. So this causes amplification of incident beam by stimulated emission. So then the laser beam is produced. That is why we need population inversion means this condition has to be satisfied for us to get laser. So, always we strive to get population inversion before going to lazing action. So, what are the conditions for population inversion? So, it should have at least a pair of energy levels, two energy levels such that one is greater than the other. And there also should be a continuous supply of energy to the system. Means when you are supplying energy to the system, the atoms will get excited to the go to the excited state. Now, which process gives the laser its special properties as an optical source? So, what are the uh, processes that give laser the special properties? So, in stimulated emission, the photons produced is of the same energy as the one which causes it. Means, the incident photon and the emitted photon, they have the same energy. So, the light associated with stimulated photon is in phase. They are in phase with each other. And it is in contrast to spontaneous emission. In spontaneous emission, the radiation obtained is not coherent. So, here what we are getting is coherent radiation. So, therefore, it is a better optical source than LED. So, laser forms a better, better optical source than LED. Now, which is the law that mentions the population of atoms in an energy state? We are talking about the number of atoms in the lower state, number of atoms in the higher state. Which law gives us that? So, the Boltzmann distribution law specifies what fraction of atoms are found in that particular energy state? And it is given by the formula ln n1 by n0 is equal to minus of E1 minus E0 or we can write it as E0 minus E1 which is minus delta E by kt. So, this relation gives us what fraction of atoms are found in a given energy state. What is gain medium in a laser? Gain medium is a medium which can amplify the power of light. Gain, gain here is representing the amplification. So, typically it is in the form of a light beam. That is what we are calling it as the gain medium. What is pumping? 
Pumping here means what? For maintaining the state of population inversion, the atoms have to be raised continuously to the excited state. So we have seen the number of atoms which are there in the lower level, they have to go to the excited state. Unless we supply energy, they cannot go. So it requires energy to be supplied to the system. And this process of supplying energy to the medium in order to transfer the atoms from the ground level to the excited state, we call it as pumping. Then what is optical pumping? We have seen in general pumping. Pumping is the process of sending the atoms from lower energy level to higher energy level. So in optical pumping, what we see here is light is used as a source to raise the electrons from lower level to higher level. Then we call it as optical pumping and this is commonly used in laser construction to pump active laser medium to achieve the population inversion. If we want population inversion, we will have to pump the atom. So what type of pumping we are using here is optical pumping that is light. Now what is electrical discharge pumping? We have seen optical pumping. Now what is electric discharge? So in this method, electric discharge acts as the pump or the source. So what we do here is a high voltage electric discharge is passed through the laser medium. So then what happens? The intense electric field accelerates the electrons and they collide with the atoms, other atoms in the gas. So because of these collisions, there is transfer of energy. And the atoms in the lower state will gain the energy and go to the higher energy level. So that is how pumping occurs. They go to the higher energy state. So we call it as electrical discharge pumping. Then what type of laser causes skin cancer? We have different types of laser. Gas laser, solid laser, then semiconductor laser and then one laser which we call as eczema laser which causes skin cancer. So exposure to this type of laser have to be strictly avoided because it causes skin cancer. Then uh, what are the characteristics of laser? The characteristics which make laser so important is highly monochromatic. It is highly monochromatic. Monochromatic means light of single wavelength. Then high degree of coherence. Coherence means they are in the same phase. So the emitted light and the incident photon, they will be in the same phase. Then you say it is coherent. Then high directionality means it is a very sharp beam with high focus. So it has got high directionality and high brightness because it's an intense beam. It is very bright. So all these characteristics make laser so special and so useful. Then which one is a unique property of laser? We have, we have seen different properties, but out of all that which is very unique, coherence is an important character which is very unique. So what happens here is it's an important characteristic because in laser beam, the wave trains are of the same frequency and are in phase. Due to high coherence, it results in extremely high power laser. So whenever we want a high power laser, the extent of coherence has to be very high. Now, which type of laser is an example of optical pumping? So optical pumping, we have already seen where light is used for pumping the atoms from lower level to higher level. So the atoms of ruby are excited with the help of photons that are emitted by external optical source. And the atoms will absorb the energy and raise to excited state. So ruby laser is an example for optical pumping. If you see here, this is the example. This is the ruby rod we have. So there is a helical lamp surrounding. Now, this lamp, when there is a flash in the lamp, we also call it as flash lamp. So when there is a flash, 
that energy is absorbed by the atoms and they go to the higher level. And because we are using light here, we are calling it as optical pumping. Now, what is active medium in a helium neon laser? So, helium neon laser is a gas laser. So, in this gas laser, we take helium ions and also ne neon. So, helium and neon gas is the active medium here. The active medium is a helium neon gas. And which type of pumping is used in helium neon? In ruby laser, we have seen it is optical pumping. And in helium neon laser, we are going to use electrical pumping method. Means the excitation of electrons in the helium neon gas, that is the active medium, is achieved by passing an electric current through the gas. So when we pass electric current through the gas, this helium neon gas, they will absorb the energy and go to the excited state. So, the excitation of electrons is due to the electric current. So, we call it as electrical pumping method. Now, how do we differentiate ruby laser and helium neon laser? So, ruby laser will only emit short bursts of light because I said we are using optical pumping and it's a flash lamp. So, whenever there are flashes, the atoms are receiving the energy. So, there is a short burst of laser light. But whereas in helium neon laser, it is a continuous laser. And it was the first continuous laser that was constructed. So, the major difference is this is a, this can only emit short bursts. It is intermittent and not continuous. But whereas helium neon laser is continuous laser. Now we'll go to the next part, part two in module three, that is fiber optics. Here we are going to talk about construction, working of optical fiber, then acceptance angle and numerical aperture. We are going to see the types of optical fiber, optical fiber communication, and also some applications. So, what is the principle of optical fiber communication? So, what on what principle does this optical communication work? So, in optical fibers, light entering the fiber does not encounter any new surfaces, but repeatedly they hit the same surface. So, if you see in the diagram here, light is entering. We call this is the core, this surface it is going. It is repeatedly hit here only and not going out. That is the meaning. Repeatedly they hit the same surface. And it comes out, light out. This is light in and light out. So the reason for confining the light beam inside is total internal reflection. So, the principle on which it works is total internal reflection. So, what are the different components of optical fiber? So, we see three main parts even though there are different parts. What we see here are three main parts in optical fiber. So, the first one is the core. Second is the cladding and then the outer jacket. You see in the diagram here, uh, this part is the core. The core here is surrounded by the cladding and then the outer coating or the outer jacket. So, there are other materials also which gives strength and protection. But we are concerned about three main parts. That is the core, the cladding and the outer coating. Now define core of optical fiber. What is core? So core is the region in which the light is guided. The core is a region uh, of slightly increased refractive index. So when you see here in this figure, this part which is illuminated is the core 
and this part is the cladding. The core is always surrounded by cladding. So what is core? It is the region through which light is guided. You can see in the figure, the light travels only through the core. It does not come into the cladding. And always we see that the refractive index of the core, mu1, is greater than the refractive index of the cladding. You may denote it by n1 or mu1. n1 should be greater than n2. The refractive index of the core should always be greater than the refractive index of the cladding. Now define cladding. What is cladding? So cladding causes light to be confined to the core of the fiber by total internal reflection at the boundary between the two. And it has lower refractive index compared to the core. We have already discussed this point. The refractive index of the core is greater than the cladding. Now we have seen that core is used to guide the light. And cladding is used to confine the light through the core. We are keeping the condition for total internal reflection such that the refractive index of the core greater than the refractive index of the cladding. And this is the condition that is required for total internal reflection. Total internal reflection here means the light gets reflected back into the same medium without going out. So cladding is used to confine the light into the core by keeping the condition such that refractive index of the core is greater than the refractive index of cladding. Then define Snell's law. What is Snell's law? Snell's law, it's a law of refraction where it relates the angle of the incident light and the angle of the transmitted light. Mu always is given by sin i upon sin r. Snell's law is the ratio of the sine of the angle of incidence to the sine of angle of refraction is always constant for a given pair of media. If you are taking say here glass and air, the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction, whatever may be the angles, mu is always a constant. That is the law given by the scientist Snell. So we are calling it as Snell's law. Now coming to what is refractive index. Define refractive index of a medium. So the refractive index is uh, given by the ratio of the velocity of the light to the velocity in the medium. So n is equal to c by v. n here represents the refractive index. c is the velocity of light which is constant and v is the velocity of light in that particular medium. So when we are talking about refractive index of different materials, that definitely depends upon the velocity of light with which it travels in that particular medium. Next, define acceptance angle. What is acceptance angle? It is the maximum angle of a ray hitting the fiber which allows the light to pass through the core. Now, if you see here, the angle at which it has to be incident inside the core. What angle it has to be incident so that the light will travel through the core. That angle we are calling it as acceptance angle. It is the maximum angle. If you, if a light is incident at an angle greater than this acceptance angle, it would not travel through the core. That particular signal is lost. So we are calling acceptance angle as the maximum angle at which it has to be incident for light to travel through the core. Now what is acceptance cone? So once we have defined the acceptance angle, how do we get the cone? Cone is what? It is the cone in which the light is incident at an acceptance angle or less than the acceptance angle. Then it can propagate through the fiber. How do we get this acceptance cone? If I take this axis along the core, 
and rotate it at a acceptance angle. So when we rotate, we get a cone like this. So all the signals that are incident inside this cone will travel through the optical fiber or can pass through the core. If any light that is incident outside the cone that cannot pass through the optical fiber. So that is the meaning of acceptance cone. Define numerical aperture. What is numerical aperture? It is the light gathering capacity of the optical fiber. And it is given by the sign of the acceptance angle. So numerical aperture usually denoted by Na. So it is the sign of the acceptance angle. We have already defined the acceptance angle. The angle at which it has to be incident for it to pass through the optical fiber. So numerical aperture depends upon the acceptance angle. It is a sign of the acceptance angle and it gives us the measure of the light gathering capacity of the optical fiber. Now define fractional refractive index change in optical fibers. So how do we define this fractional refractive index change? So if we consider N1 is the refractive index of core, N2 will be the refractive index of cladding. If we have to find the fractional refractive change, which is denoted by delta, delta will be equal to N1 minus N2 upon N1. So this gives us the fractional change in refractive index. Now, how does the refractive index vary in a graded index fiber? So first we'll understand what is a graded index fiber. So in a graded index fiber, the refractive index of the core is maximum along the fiber axis and it gradually decreases. So here what we understand is the refractive index of the core is not uniform throughout. Along the axis, this is the axis of the core, the refractive index is more and it will decrease gradually from the axis. That is what we call as graded index. It is graded. It is not continuous. The refractive index gradually decreases towards the surface. Now which of the following has more distortion? Which of the following in the case if it is graded index or step index? So when we rays travel longer distances there will be difference in the refracted angles. So high angle rays arrive later than low angle rays. So rays that are traveling at a higher angle will arrive late than low. Suppose here we are talking about two rays A and B. So ray B is traveling straight. It is traveling a lesser distance when compared to the ray B. So when you see here at the output, ray A arrives faster than ray B. So this gives rise to a distorted signal because B arrives later than A. So this is the cause for distortion. So what we are understanding here is if all the signals do not arrive at the same time, it gives rise to distortion. So we will stop here and we'll continue in our next class. Thank you and see you again. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.